Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Delaney, and um, I'm delighted to um, present um, a recruitment update um, with my colleague, uh, Lorna Scully. And since our last webinar, what we wanted to do was to highlight some of the up-to-date issues affecting the recruitment sector and those businesses that supply people or services. And indeed, the areas we're going to cover are quite wide. They include some new legislation, updated guidance on holiday pay for irregular workers, also some compliance issues, HMRC announcements and updates to its employment status manual, um, a Bible or a must for those who are involved in providing um, staff, as well as changes that have also been announced in the recent awesome statement. And I wanted to share with you as well some thoughts about business models that we're being asked to um, advise on, which are being promoted by organisations relating to the supply of people or services, which again, in which boundaries are being pushed all of the time. And as recently as yesterday, again, I want to draw your attention to a decision of the Employment Appeal Tribunal, Lutz and Ryan Eyre. And in that particular case, um, and it's relevant to what I'll be talking about later, Mr Lutz was requested to provide his services as a pilot through an intermediary company called MCG Aviation Limited. If he didn't provide his services in that way, then he wouldn't get work. And he successfully brought claims against the intermediary and also Ryanair as the hirer for unpaid holiday pay, paid breaks. And importantly, he also persuaded the Employment Appeal Tribunal that he was in fact an agency worker and therefore was entitled to the benefits under the agency worker regulations. And because he had been with Ryanair for some years, he was entitled to receive basic terms and conditions as if he were employed by Ryanair as well. And in that case, both parties, Ryanair and the intermediary argued that Lutz was self-employed. But again, the Employment Appeal Tribunal held that the arrangements that were being put in place were in effect a sham and therefore they weren't prepared to uphold the contractual arrangements that uh, were in place. So again, that will feed into what I'm going to be talking about later today on the supply of staff against supply of services. So without further ado, let's deal with the first issue, the agency and tem temporary workers update. Next slide, please. On the 5th of October, 2023, HMRC updated its employment status manual containing guidance to agency and temp workers, particularly surrounding the deducting the, the deduction of PAYE taxes. As I'm sure you're all aware, mostly on the call here, that all intermediaries that supply workers to its clients are treated as employers and are obliged to make PAYE deductions. And I've set out on the slide the conditions that are to be met if PAYE are to be deducted. And they include conditions such as individuals supplying services to a client. And those services are not excluded services. The excluded services generally include the services provided by actors, singers, musicians, photographers, who by very nature of their services are deemed to be, in most cases, self-employed. That if a contract exists between the agency, the client, the hire of the end user, and the worker, importantly, is subject to supervision, direction, and control, then in those circumstances, PAYE must be deducted. And again, as I've set out on the slide there, there is a presumption, it's a starting point as far as HMRC are concerned, that individuals who are supplied will be subject to supervision, direction, and control, either by the agency or indeed the hirer. Next slide. What um, HMRC are doing now is they are updating the employment status test and also looking more closely at the concept of supervision, 
direction and control, which is not defined in any legislation. So the agency rules won't apply if the individual who is being supplied would be regarded as self-employed as if he were working directly for the client. But again, there is no statutory test to determine whether individuals um, are employed for tax purposes. And what you have is a whole range of tests and principles laid down by various employment and tax cases over the last 20 years or so to determine status in particularly whether or not there's mutuality of obligation, whether there's a personal service, whether there's a right of substitution, whether there's control, the basis of the payments that are being made to the individual, the number of engagements, and whether the person is in business on their own account. All those principles are taken into account by HMRC to determine whether someone is genuinely self-employed or employed. And also as well, many hirers again will also be familiar with the Check for Employment Status Test portal operated by HMRC. And again, that portal was updated in October 2023, which allows users when they're trying to get a definitive answer from HMRC about the individual whom they are hiring, or whether they are employed or self-employed, there is now um, an ability to make reference to the various employment status manual tests, um, which are laid out in the manual for guidance. But again, as I'm sure you're all aware, if you are relying on these assessed outcomes, then HMRC expect full disclosure. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what HMRC have done in their recent announcement, again, is focusing on the concept of supervision, direction and control for the purposes of deducting tax. Next slide, please. On this slide, you will see a reference to three types of um, workers, locum pharmacists, market researchers, and drama teachers, all of whom were until recently, were considered by HMRC generally as being self-employed. But their status has actually been removed from the employment status manual. So it therefore must be now called into question as to whether or not, if you are a business that are supplying these types of workers, whether or not you can still rely on the fact that they are self-employed. But the amendments I want to draw your attention to are the four categories of workers relating to IT consultants, HGV drivers, security officers, and domestic helpers. And again, HMRC is giving some guidance as to whether or not such categories of persons are indeed to be regarded as employed either by the agency or the hirer or self-employed. And again, they're looking at this concept of supervision, direction and control. In the case of IT consultants, the guidance makes it clear that where an end user engages an IT consultant, for example, maybe to design a website with no time constraints or control over the way in which the website is built. In those circumstances, HMRC will regard the IT consultant as not being under the end hirer's supervision, direction and control. That's to be contrasted with an IT consultant who goes into a business five days a week, sits at the same desk and is subject to the supervision, direction and control of line managers. Also as well, certainly in recent years, those businesses that supply HGV drivers and security officers, again, have been able to argue with HMRC that such categories of persons are genuinely self-employed. But under the new guidance, there is a reference to the obligation on the part of these drivers or security officers to having 
to be subject to health and safety or other regulation. So say, for example, a HGV driver is now going to be regarded as being subject to supervision, direction and control because of the because of the requirement to restrict driving duties. And similarly with a security officer, a security officer who is guarding a building site or other office, um, maybe overnight, who dictates when they go around and inspect the premises. Again, HMRC now regards such duties, again, as being subject to health and safety. So again, there is this concept of these categories of workers being subject to supervision, direction and control, and therefore their pay will be subject to PAY deductions. Domestic helpers, again, um, again, it's a question of fact, but domestic helpers who go in and perform personal services for householders will generally still be regarded as being self-employed. Next slide, please. The other announcement as well that was made um, in the autumn statement relates to HMRC's intention to introduce, to introduce legislation in the Finance Act 2024. Um, and this relates to payers who've been essentially subject to fines or assessments as a result of incorrectly categorizing whether or not an assignment which is undertaken by an individual through their personal service company is um, outside IR35 when the revenue have taken a different view. So in particular, where the fee payer, which is generally the hirer, or indeed it could be the temp agency, is obliged to deduct taxes if after the hirer carries out the status determination statement and they are a large employer, and there is an obligation to deduct taxes. If that assessment is incorrect, then the fee payer could be liable to pay HMRC back taxes, interest penalties, and importantly, both employer and employee national insurance contributions. Um, this can amount to a bit of a windfall um, on the part of HMRC, because of course, there is an obligation those who've made the assessment incorrectly and who are responsible for paying um, these workers to be responsible for back taxes. And of course, the revenue may also have recovered taxes as well from the intermediary or indeed the worker. So there is going to be introduced what is called a set off, whereby HMRC will reduce the level of tax interest penalties that it seeks to recover from those who've got the assessment wrong as against the tax that has already been paid by the worker or the intermediary. It's difficult to see how this might work um, in practice because of course, the relationship between HMRC and the taxpayer is confidential. And it may be very difficult that if you are an agency or indeed a hirer and you've been subject to um, a demand for taxes in relation to an assignment where you've categorized that incorrectly it might be difficult to actually get information as to what the set off or how much the set off in taxes is likely to be but hmrc have said that they will be issuing guidance and regulations and this will all be coming into effect in the spring of next year over to you lorna Thanks, Michael. I can have the next slide, please. Thanks. So, as you may be aware, the government has been consulting on proposals to regulate umbrella companies. So this was a joint consultation carried out by um, HM Treasury, uh, HMRC and the Department for Business and Trade. Uh, they published a consultation seeking views on some policy options to tackle non-compliance within the umbrella company market. The consultation opened in June 2023 and it invited comments on their policy proposals to regulate umbrella companies both in terms of addressing employment rights abuse and to tackle tax non-compliance which it felt was causing harm to workers, businesses and taxpayers. 
So the consultation followed a Treasury call for evidence, which was published in November 2021, and which saw approximately 400 responses come in. Now, that call for evidence gathered significant information from stakeholders on the role that umbrella companies play in the labour market. And a significant number of respondents to that call for evidence said that they supported intervention in the market to improve the treatment of workers, to level the playing field for umbrella company operators, and to ensure tax compliance. And in response to that call for evidence, the government has already taken some steps, and in particular, it's provided updated guidance on working through umbrella companies on the government website. So the consultation document set out the actions it had already taken and then set out some further steps that were under consideration to prevent future non-compliance with a view to delivering improved outcomes for workers, supporting that level playing field and protecting taxpayers. So firstly, uh, in order to address employment rights, it highlighted that there was a need to get a clear definition of an umbrella company in place in order to then regulate uh, effectively the umbrella companies. So it proposed two different approaches for defining umbrella companies. Uh, the first definition focuses on the way that umbrella companies are engaged and the second definition looks at the nature of the activity that they are undertaking and it highlighted that there were benefits and risks of each approach and asked for feedback on those and then it uh, also consulted uh, views on how, once a definition was put in place, umbrella companies should be regulated. And the two options it proposed in, in that respect were firstly, to take a sort of targeted uh, reactive approach, focusing on key areas of non-compliance, in particular, the handling of holiday pay. Uh, and the second option was to take a much wider approach, setting minimum standards for the way umbrella companies are involved in working in the agency supply chain. And it proposed that the Employment Agency Standards Inspectorate would be involved in the regulation of umbrella companies. If I could have the next slide, please. So uh, as well as looking at employment rights abuses within the market, it also looked at ways of tackling tax non-compliance in, in the umbrella company market, which has been a significant concern. Uh, and the government explored three main options for addressing this issue, which it hopes will uh, improve behaviours within the temporary labour market. So the first option would be uh, to require some mandatory due diligence, and it proposes that uh, responsibility for that might lie with either the employment business or the end client, or giving HMRC the power to collect unpaid umbrella company tax debts from another business in the supply chain, which it felt would encourage end clients and employment businesses to be more selective in choosing their umbrella companies that they work with. Uh, and the third option would be to deem the employment business that supplies the worker to the end client to be the employer for tax purposes, even though there is another company operating the payroll on its behalf. And the consultation all set out to um, targeted options to address some specific areas of tax non-compliance relating to the VAT flat rate scheme and employment allowance. So stakeholders were asked to share their views on how all these options could be further developed um, and the consultation closed on the 29th of August 2023. So in terms of next steps, what can we expect? Um, it's likely uh, that it's going to be some time, I think, before we hear anything further on this in terms of a response from the government. And this is because there's a number of reasons. It's likely that there will be a significant number of respondents taking into account the number of respondents there were to that previous call for evidence. And it's also likely that the uh, responses are going to come in from a number of different angles. So they're going to require some quite detailed analysis. And also, because this is a joint com consultation between a number of government departments, it's going to need some joining up and the involvement of the um, ESI as well is likely to slow things down. So I suspect it will be some time before we get a response to that, but definitely watch this space. And if I could have the next slide, please. Thanks. 
So now we're looking at a recent uh, judicial review um, relating to the use of agency staff to cover striking workers. And as you may be aware, until July 2022, employment businesses were prohibited by Regulation 7 of the Conduct of Employment Agencies and Employment Business Regulations from providing work seekers to hirers to replace individuals taking part in official strike action or to replace individuals who had themselves been transferred by the hirer to perform the duties of someone who was taking industrial action. And back in July 2015, the government launched a consultation on the removal of Regulation 7 of the Conduct Regulations. Um, and the majority of uh, responses to that consultation didn't favour a change in the law. And in 2016, the government said it wasn't going to go ahead with the proposal. But in 2022, in the context of industrial action in the rail sector and other anticipated industrial action, the government decided that it was going to revoke Regulation 7 without any further consultation. And on the 21st of July 2022, the Conduct of Employment Agencies and Employment Businesses Amendment Regulations came into force to implement this change. And that removed the ban on employers using agency workers to perform the duties normally performed by striking workers during industrial action. Now, 13 trade unions applied for judicial review of the government's decision to make the amendment regulations. They argued that the relevant Secretary of State, Kwasi Kwarteng, had failed to comply with his statutory duty to consult before making the amendment regulations, and that he breached the duty under Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights to prevent unlawful interference with the rights of trade unions and their members. Secretary of State contested both grounds of the application and he argued that his duty to consult was met by that earlier 2015 consultation or alternatively he argued that relief should be refused because it was highly likely that the outcome would not have been substantially different if there had been consultation. And he also argued that the revocation of Regulation 7 did not amount to an interference with the rights of trade unions and Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights. I can have the next slide, please. So the High Court allowed the application for judicial review. Uh, the judge noted that when making regulations under Section 12 of the Employment Agencies Act, there is an obligation to consult with bodies which are representative of the relevant interests in the recruitment sector, and that the aim of this is to enhance the decision making by requiring the Secretary of State to take into account the views and opinions of those who are likely to be well informed in the area. Uh, he noted that Section 12 is not detailed precisely as to what's required in terms of consultation, but he said that therefore consultation should be fair and the approach he was going to take was to decide whether the consultation had been so unfair as to be unlawful. And in a very scathing judgment, the judge found that even assuming that the requirements of Section 12 could have been met by the Secretary of State conscientiously considering the responses of that earlier 2015 consultation before he introduced his amendment regulations, he found that the Secretary of State had not done so. In fact, Mr Quarton had been offered a detailed analysis of the responses to the 2015 consultation, but he had not asked to see it. And in the court's view, this was indicative of Mr Quarton's lack of interest in evidence or views about the proposal. Consequently, the court held that the Secretary of State's decision about whether Regulation 7 should be revoked was not informed by or tested against the views and evidence of bodies who were representative of the interests concerned. Not even, in fact, the views of the bodies that were expressed in 2015. So the judicial review challenge succeeded on the above basis alone. However, the court went on to consider the lawfulness of the Secretary of State's decision not to consult further about the revocation of Regulation 7 in 2022. And the court found that even if the Secretary of State had conscientiously considered the responses to the 2015 consultation before taking his decision in June 2022, it would still have been unfair and inconsistent with the aims of Section 12 for him to fail to take updated views and evidence and this is because there had been several key developments in the period in between the earlier consultation and the implementation. Not least, the impl implementation of the Trade Union Act 2016, Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic, all of which had had an impact on the labour market. 
So given the lapse in time since the 2015 consultation and the developments in the intervening period, and taking into account the reasons why the proposal had not been implemented in 2016, the Secretary of State's approach was, the judge found, so unfair as to be unlawful and indeed irrational. And for the above reasons, the court was not persuaded that it was highly likely that further consultation would have resulted in the same outcome, as it was not possible to accurately predict what the responses to a further consultation might have been. The court therefore rejected the Secretary of State's argument that relief should be refused, and it quashed the amendment regulations with effects on the 10th of August 2023. So from that date, it has been unlawful again for employment businesses to supply temporary workers to employers to cover those involved in strike action. Uh, in light of the court's conclusions uh, in relation to lack of consultation, it found that there was no need for it to express a view in relation to the arguments as to whether the regulations were in breach of Article 11 of the European Court on Human Rights. I have to have the next slide, please. Thank you. But the government has not given up on the idea. Um, it considers that the issue of reducing uh, disruption caused by strike action remains high on its agenda, as it considers that the prohibition of the use of agency staff during industrial action has an unnecessary and disproportionate impact on employers. But rather than appeal against the High Court judgment, the government has instead commenced a new consultation on the same proposal. The consultation launched on the 16th of November 2023. The government states within the consultation document, its view is that Regulation 7 should be repealed. It states that this is a permissive measure that will enable but not require employment businesses to supply agency workers to cover strikes. It points out it would not prevent unions calling strikes or affect the protection of available to striking workers and agency workers themselves would be free to turn down assignments if they wish to. So the, the consultation is currently proposing to repeal Regulation 7 entirely for all, but there is a more limited option where it could be repealed in certain sectors only. Once views are received, if the proposal is confirmed as going ahead, then regulations will be required uh, to be implemented in order to, to introduce. So, uh, there may still be a delay before uh, further regulations come into force. And of course, when they do, it will still be open for unions to raise a challenge on the basis that the regulations interfere with their Article 11 rights under the European Convention on Human Rights, because that's the element of the judgment that wasn't that was never decided in the earlier case. So the closing date for consultation is the 16th of January 2024. Uh, so if there is any views that, that uh, you'd like to express, then please do do so uh, in the next month or so. Thank you. If I can have the next slide, please. Okay. So we're now going to look at the Workers' Predictable Terms and Conditions Act 2023. So at present, there is no statutory right to request a more predictable working pattern. But back in 2017, when uh, the Matthew Taylor undertook his review of modern working practices, he identified the, what he called the problem of one-sided flexibility, which is where a worker has no guarantee of work, but is expected to be available at very short notice when required. He felt that that created unpredictability of working hours, income insecurity and reluctance among workers to assert basic employment rights. And back in 2018, when the government published its response to the Taylor Review, the Good Work Plan, it said that it would legislate to introduce a right for all workers to request a more predictable and stable contract after 26 weeks service, and also to consult on some proposals put forward by the Low Pay Commission. Uh, the low pay commission proposals were that uh, workers should get a uh, right to reasonable notice of working hours and also a right to compensation for shift cancellation or curtailment without reasonable notice. So the government had originally indicated that um, progress on uh, addressing this one sided flexibility would be a measure that would be included in an employment bill. However, we've still not had an employment 
bill and on uh february 2023 uh it announced that it had instead decided to uh give support to a private member's bill the workers predictable terms and conditions bill and that it would use this as a way of addressing uh the one-sided uh flexibility issue um the government however decided it wouldn't go forward with the low pay commission's recommendations and it would just instead introduce this right to request um, a more predictable working pattern uh, that it drew a parallel with the existing right to request a flexible working request so there's no right to have it there's just a right to request which must be considered now the Workers' Predictable Terms and Conditions Bill received royal assent on the 18th of September this year, becoming the Workers' Predictable Terms and Conditions Act, uh, and it's to come into force on a date to be specified. It's not yet in force, but we're expecting that it will come into force in around about September 2024. So what will it do? Well, the Act, when in force, will give both workers and agency workers the right to request more predictable terms and conditions of work. It'll do so using a statutory framework, which, as I've said, is modelled very much on the existing flexible working regime. Um, but regulations yet to come to be drafted will provide some further details. What we're expecting is that there will be a new chapter uh, inserted into the Employment Rights Act dealing with the right for workers to request a more predictable working pattern. Another new chapter dealing with the right uh, for agency workers to request a more predictable working pattern. And another new chapter dealing with um, restrictions on multiple applications. So it's proposed that as as with the flexible working regime, employers will be able to refuse requests for set specific statutory reasons. Um, so it should mean that employers and industries that rely on unpredictable working arrangements are still able to refuse such applications, but they will need to introduce process for dealing with requests. So uh, next slide, please. So in relation to aging agency workers specifically, what it will give is agency workers the right uh, to do two things. Firstly, an agency worker, and it uses the definition of agency workers set out in the agency worker regulations, will be able to apply to their temporary work agency uh, for a change in terms and conditions if there is a lack of predictability in relation to the work they're supplied by the agency to do for a particular hire, as regards any part of their work pattern, the change relates to the agency's workers' work pattern, and the agency workers' purpose in applying for the change is to secure a more predictable working pattern. Secondly, an agency worker, using the same definition as I said, will be able to apply directly to a hire under whose supervision and direction they are working for the hirer to enter into a contract of employment or other workers contract with the agency worker if the following conditions apply there is a lack of predictability in relation to the work they do for the hirer in relation to any part of their work pattern the change relates to the work agency workers work pattern and the agency workers purpose in applying for the change is to get a more predictable working pattern and work pattern is made up of either or comprises either the number of hours they work, the days of the week, or the times of the days they work, the period they are supplied to work, or such other aspects of workers' terms as may be specified by regulations. So at the moment, it's a little bit vague, but what we do know is that where an agency worker's contract provides for the agency worker to be supplied for a period of less than 12 months, then there will be a presumption of lack of predictability. Uh, and so that certainly will give them the opportunity uh, to, to make an application. So in terms of how they make an application, the agency workers application must state that it's an application for a predictable working pattern and must specify if it's an application to the temporary work agency, the change applied for and the date on which it's proposed to become effective, 
And if it's an application directly to a hire, it must specify whether the application is for a contract of employment or some other worker contract and the date on which it's proposed that the contract would start. Regulations may specify further um, requirements for the application form. So under the regulations, there will be a period of service, a minimum period of service necessary in order to make an application for a predictable working pattern. And that period is expected to be 26 weeks and a worker will be limited to making any more than two requests in any 12 month period. So when a uh, hirer or temporary work agency receives a request, then they must deal with the application in a reasonable manner. They must notify the agency worker of their decision within the decision period, which is going to be defined as one month, beginning with the date on which the application is made. And they may only reject the application on one of the statutory grounds. At the moment, we know that the statutory grounds will include burden of additional costs, detrimental effect on ability to meet customer demand, detrimental impact on the recruitment of staff, detrimental impact on other aspects of the employer's business, insufficiency of work during the periods the agency worker proposes to work, planned structural changes, and there may be other grounds specified in the regulations. And uh, an agency worker will be able to make a claim to an employment tribunal if there has been a procedural failing by either the hire or employment business in dealing with their application. And that would um, include the grounds that they failed to deal with their application in a reasonable manner, in a reasonable manner, which is failed to notify the worker agency worker of the decision within the decision period, which will be a month. Uh, rejected the application for a reason other than one of the permitted statutory ground or rejected the application based on incorrect facts. Uh, and where there is a procedural failing, then the tribunal must make a declaration to that effect and then will order a reconsideration of the application and can also award compensation up to a set maximum and at the moment if we draw parallels with the flexible working regime the maximum for a procedural failing is eight weeks pay and there will also be two additional types of claim that will be brought and that would be a claim for unlawful detriment or automatic unfair dismissal if the worker is either subjected to a detriment short of dismissal or dismissed as a result of having made post to make an application for a more predictable working pattern uh, and if a claim is upheld by the tribunal, a claim for detriment will uh, see an uh, ability to award com such compensation as is just and equitable in all the circumstances. And that's no cap on that. And uh, the claim for automatic unfair dismissal, uh, again, will fault that will they'll have the ability to claim statutory unfair dismissal damages for that, and there will be no minimum period of qualifying service though. So a uh, significant sea change, I think, in terms of um, the way uh, agency workers are able to, to assert the statutory right coming. And if I could just move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, as I say, the Act is expected to come into force in September 2024, and in preparation for this, ACAS has commenced a consultation on a new statutory code of practice on handling requests for a predictable working pattern. Uh, this code outlines pro suggested processes that employers and agencies should follow when dealing with such requests in order to ensure a fair process. So the draft code is split into distinct sections, one addressing requests made by workers to employers and the other addressing requests made by agency workers to either their agency or hirer. And the process envisaged under the draft code of practice is very similar to the process ACAS recommends for dealing with a flexible working request. So it suggests that a meeting will be held without unreasonable delay to discuss the request and the impact of the request on both the uh, agency hire a worker. Uh, the worker should be permitted to be accompanied to that meeting. 
even though it's not proposed that this is a statutory entitlement. Uh, employers should confirm the outcome of the request in writing within a reasonable time frame, and if the reject request is rejected, reasons should be provided. Uh, there should be a right of appeal offered, and all requests, including the decision on the appeal, should be communicated with on, within one month of the date of the request. Where the request is accepted, the employer must offer the worker a new contract within two weeks of acceptance. And it's proposed that this new uh, draft code of practice will also be accompanied by non-statutory guidance on which APAS is also consulting. So that consultation process is open until the 17th of January 2024 uh, and workers, employers and agencies are encouraged to share their thoughts and insights on helping to refine the code of practice and ensure that it adequately meets the needs of all parties. And uh, in anticipation for this change, it would be sensible to take steps to ensure that you have a process in place and that your managers are trained on spotting requests and dealing properly with any requests. So thanks for that. Now I'm going to hand back to Mike. Next slide, please, Alice. <clears throat> Right. Um, I'm going to look now at the um, different business models that we're being asked to advise upon um, from time to time. And I think this is um, a useful reminder, particularly in, in the light of the Ryanair decision that I was talking about earlier. Business models relating to the supplying of people are becoming more blurred. The lines are being pushed due to economic circumstances, invariably to reduce taxes, regulation, and also not to confer rights on individuals. And if you look at this slide on the left-hand side of the page, supply of staff, you have what I would call the traditional um, model where the agency worker um, is supplied by the um, recruitment, so, sorry, the employment business um, for hire to an end user client. And there's no direct contract between the client and the agency worker. The agency deducts taxes. HMRC, very happy. Individual also has protection under the agency worker regulations. But certainly in recent years, um, we've noted that business models are now being changed. Take, for example, an organisation that purports to supply the services of individuals under the pretext of supplying services, whether they're management services, whether they relate to regulatory compliance, financial services. And the end user essentially has a commercial contract with the supplier of the, of the people and the individuals, either they get paid by the end user and pay the agency a finder's fee, normally 5%, or indeed the supplier actually pays the individual a fixed rate. And what I'm seeing as well are other models that are now being introduced, for example, where companies offer to supply details of persons, particularly in regulatory compliance, financial services, pharmacy, where they charge a subscription fee to a user of the website and the user of the website can see details of persons who are available um, to provide their services. And again, um, the question arises, is this arrangement caught? Are the suppliers of the individuals, are they running an employment business or simply is it an offer to supply staff, i.e. an introductory service? And again, these arrangements are producing challenges both to all parties, to the supplier of the persons, to the end hirer, and also the individuals. And of course, if agencies supply staff, then they are subject to the conduct regulations, the whole regulatory regime governing the supply of temporary staff and of course the obligation 
to deduct um, taxes from the agency workers, unlike where there is a supply of services, individuals are generally regarded as being self-employed and responsible for their own taxes. But I just come back to the Ryanair decision. And in that particular case, the intermediary, which was nothing more than hiring of Mr. Lud's services, was basically held by the Employment Tribunal and upheld by the Employment Appeal Tribunal as nothing more than a sham, a fictitious arrangement so as to deny Mr. Lodz his statutory protection. So again, those businesses that are just supplying staff need to be mindful, I think, of the Ryanair decision and possibly review their business practices. Next slide, please. As to whether or not, as a supplier of staff, you are an employment business or supplying services, I've set out on the slide a number of questions that you should be asking yourself um, when you are undertaking these economic activities. In particular, does the arrangement reflect economic and commercial reality? Clearly, the courts held in the Ryanair case that the arrangement was a sham and the supplying of services through an intermediary um, was nothing more than uh, essentially a deterrent to give Mr. Lodz um, in, uh, various statutory protection. Who controls and supervises the work. If at the end of the day, the hirer is supervising and controlling the way in which the work is being done, they, then again, I would suggest that that is pointing towards a temporary worker agency type relationship. On the other hand, if the supplier of the services is able to dictate to the individuals that it's that it is supplying to the end user, then the, the arrangement might actually work out as something different. And I refer to a case called Medassi and HMRC, which was um, re widely reported in the case that we were involved in um, about a couple of years ago. And in that particular case, I can talk about it because it's in the public domain, um, Medassi supplied locum pharmacists to GP practices and they dictated to the pharmacy the way in which those services were to be provided um, to the GP practice and also members of the public. And on the facts, it was held that there was a genuine supply of services and not people. Also as well, if you are again involved in these types of arrangement, if you are supplying um, services, then again, one would expect you as a business to have insurance um, in place. Next slide, please. And again, what's important where you supply staff or services is obviously the tax treatment and liabilities. Obviously, if you're an employment business, then you will be deducting PAYE from your agency workers. Also as well, if you're supplying individuals and supplying services through personal service companies, then again, as a fee payer, if you are the agency involved, you'll be relying upon the status determination statement if the end hirer is, of course, um, a large client. And if the assignment is caught, then there is the obligation to deduct taxes and of course agencies will also be accounting for VAT on the value of um, the services it supplies. Um, also as well, those that supply services, management services or other regulatory services will also be charging that. Um, also as well in that type of arrangement, individuals will of course be paying their own taxes. But do have regard to this recent decision involving Ryanair, the intermediary was held to be fictitious, solely set up for the purposes of denying full rights to individuals. 
And again, as I was saying earlier, if you are involved in that line of business and you are supplying people um, and you're not deducting taxes and you're then subsequently held to amount to um, an operation which is caught by a regulatory regime, then obviously you could face um, the wrath of, of HMRC and demands for back taxes, interest penalties, and employer and employee national insurance. So finally, I'll hand back to Lorna, who's going to round, round up with the recent developments on holiday pay. Thanks, Mike. Yes. So this wasn't on the agenda when we when we first put it out there, but we've just had a, a recent, um, very recently uh, in middle of November, we've had the government response to the consultation it held on proposal to regulate holiday entitlement for part year and irregular hours workers. And that consultation, you may recall, was opened up following the Supreme Court decision in Brazil and Harper Trust, which had held that part year workers were entitled to um, a full 5.6 weeks annual leave regardless of the fact they only work for part of the year. And the government felt that was unfair. Uh, and its response uh, on the consultation is that it will be introducing regulations uh, in order to regulate uh, a holiday for irregular hours and part year workers. Now, the regulations themselves are due to come into force on the 1st of January 2024. Um, however, they're going to apply for leave years, holiday leave years that begin on or after the 1st of April 2024. So they won't necessarily kick in um for, for some employers if you're you know if your leave year is is uh, january to december leave year then they wouldn't kick in until january 2025 so what will the regulations do well uh they've changed a little bit from what they were originally consulting on because the feedback they got on their consultation was that actually it was overly complex so what we're getting is a much simpler uh process so firstly it will define irregular hours workers and part year workers and an irregular hours worker will be someone who uh, under their contract their number of paid hours they work in each pay period is wholly or mostly variable so uh, any sort of casual or bank workers are likely to fall into that category and part year workers are anyone who under the terms of their contract is only required to work for part of the year and there are periods of at least a week within the year during which they're not required to work or and not paid for so that's likely to cover most term time workers and any sort of seasonal workers and then uh, the effect of the regulations will be that if if your worker fits either of those two definitions then uh their default holiday entitlement will accrue essentially uh, based on this new, a new section will be inserted, which will say that holiday accrues during each pay period at the rate of 12.07% of the number of hours they've worked. So nice and simple, that's how it will accrue, unless of course, if there are periods of sickness, absence or statutory, such as paternity, maternity leave, those kind of things, then there will be some more complex 52 week average um, calculations to be done to make it fair. Uh, and then holiday pay. So once you've accrued your holiday entitlement at 12.07% of the hours worked, then your pay will be paid um, as it is generally speaking for most workers. So based on the 52 week average at the point at which the holiday is taken however as an alternative if employers wish to they can choose instead to operate a system of rolled up holiday pay and if they do operate a system choose to operate system of rolled up holiday pay then they can pay that based as a, an uplift on remuneration paid in every pay period uh, an uplift of 12.07 percent so that pay that then they don't accrue the annual leave they get paid for it as they go as it were and so uh should they take holiday at any point later they would be unpaid um and so i think in preparation for that you'll just need to review your contracts and it may well be simpler for irregular hours workers to introduce a system of rolled up holiday pay so you'll just need to review contracts and your policies and make sure that they are amended in time for whenever your relevant holiday year starts so hopefully that's an improvement uh on the current current uh case law so uh and if anyone had any questions that they wanted to ask 
please do feel free to um, type them in the chat or raise your hand or... I think, um, Lorna, we're actually running out of time. time. I'd like to thank you all for listening um, this morning. We've gone through a lot of material um, which is going to affect the way um, in which you continue to conduct business, certainly in the foreseeable future. And if any of you have any um, questions that you'd like to ask um, Lorna and I, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our um, details are on the slides, our email address and um, phone numbers. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I think um, on that note, then we'll we'll call the, the session to an end. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.